Thank you for joining me for this Lifeway study in the book of Acts chapters 1 to 12. This is session 11 and the title is Healing. The text is Acts chapter 9 verse 32 to 43. And the lesson summary statement is God invites his followers to be instruments of his power. I always write this on the board in my class because I, that's what I'm shooting for. That's the truth I'm wanting to underline as I teach the class and it just is a way I think helps to reinforce that. Now to introduce the lesson, I'm going to follow the Go Explore uh, the Bible suggestion about uh, the man who rescued the two people who were in the burning car. And I went to the website of the television station that does the interview and it's very brief and I'm going to show that to get my class started on that. Um, and then I'm going to take them to the summary statement. God invites his followers to be instruments of his power. Think how humbling that is. We actually are available. We're actually someone that God would use, a means that God would use to display his power. We're uh, powerless to do anything, but he is powerful to do anything. And when he does do his work, he oftentimes will work through his people and that means that is an exciting opportunity for all of us. Now, to properly interpret a, a narrative, you have to understand the context in which it's in because context is king. And what is happening here is the gospel is about to encounter its biggest obstacle, its biggest barrier, and it's going to go over that obstacle. And that is taking the gospel to the Gentiles. You would think that the one that God would use to do that is going to be Paul. But Paul passes off the scene and doesn't show back up until later, about chapter 15 or so. But the one that comes center stage that God uses to break through this barrier is Peter. Now, Peter is the one that Jesus said that he gave the keys to the kingdom to and that his testimony was going to be the foundation on which he builds the church and, and God is affirming Peter in these stories that we're seeing here. These, this miracle that takes place with this paralyzed man looks very much like the story we see of Jesus healing the man Lord down on the mat. And the story of Tabitha being raised from the dead has very similar uh, uh, events like the daughter of Jairus was raised from the dead. And so what Luke is presenting for us is here is God's power using God's man in God's manner and in God's words to accomplish this for the glory of God. And so in this event, what's taking place is here is, here is Jesus's man, Peter, and he is Jesus's man because we see the power of Jesus in this man. And so Peter stands upon the scene. Even after all of this kind of affirmation, we still find later that Peter's going to be called on the carpet when he takes the gospel to Cornelius. But, but it's God's way of preparing the church to take the gospel globally. That's the point that is happening in the book of Luke. God's gospel is to go to everyone and everywhere. Now the first point is make your bed, Acts chapter 9 verse 32 to 35. And so I'm going to read through the text and give some explanation, just kind of fill the picture out. Uh, verse 32, as Peter was traveling from place to place, he also, he also came down to the saints who lived in Lydda. Now he's in an itinerant ministry. He's been in Jerusalem and now that Saul is uh, been converted, uh, th they're going out side of Jerusalem, the apostles are, they're going to these little churches that have gotten started and helping to establish them. And so Peter is in this itinerant ministry. And you may want to have the people go to the maps in their Bible and show them where Jerusalem is and show them that about 30, 35 miles northwest of Jerusalem is Lydda. And Lydda is at a crossroads. There's a highway that runs out of Syria down into Egypt very important place. And there's a highway that runs from Jerusalem to the coast at Joppa. And Joppa was the only natural harbor uh, from uh, Lebanon all the way down 
to Egypt. So it was very important. Now, only small ships could get in there, and later the Romans go up the uh, coast and they build a, a, a harbor for larger ships. But it made Lydia an important crossroads, and it was a place that had a number of uh, Gentiles as well. So this is where he's at, and it says he also came down to the saints who lived in Lydia. The word saints in the scriptures in the New Testament is always plural, and it's referring to the church. Verse 33, there he found a man named Aeneas who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Apparently, he, he just came across him as the way the idea is. That word found is our word eureka. I found it. And so Aeneas is not a part of the schedule. He's not on the agenda. And so as Peter is doing the work of God and ministering to the church and in that city, he finds this man Aeneas. And we're told that he was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. I went to the internet and I found a site uh, that's entitled uh, www.spinalcord.com. And I found an article, Important Changes That Can Happen to Your Body Years After Spinal Cord Injury. And I just wanted to understand what this man's condition was. Because it says, it, that think about this, he had, he had been in his bed for eight years. Uh, the morning, the afternoon, the evening, the nighttime. How, much, how difficult that must have been. And what this article does is it describes what happens to the body when you have had paralysis. Now, we, we're not told the extent of his paralysis. The, the word is just simply talking about uh, a portion of the body that's not functioning. But uh, just one paragraph from this says, the muscles throughout your body will respond in a variety of ways when you live several years with a spinal cord injury. While spasticity and atrophy are common, another issue that can occur in, is muscles becoming weak in the joints and making it difficult for bone structures to stay in place. And a perfect example of this is drop foot. The muscles become unable to hold the ankle in a straight position in uh, the foot plate. And there are just several other things. It talks about uh, heterotopic ossification. You'll have to read about that one. Uh, it talks about bladder stones. It talks about a large range, a loss of range of motion. It talks about scoliosis. Uh, if you lose strength in your body and your, the uh, muscles of your torso, your spine begins to uh, bend. And then there's osteoporosis. And it said that it's almost inevitable that that would happen. So what I'm trying to do is I'm wanting to build a picture of the desperate condition of this man so that we can see the tremendous miracle that God performs and, and how he does it with, such, with so little effort. So this man paralyzed, bedridden for eight years. Now notice verse 34. Peter said to him, think about that. He just, he just spoke to him. Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. And notice this next. And immediately he got up. So all who lived in Lydia and Sharon, Sharon's talking about a plain that's 55 miles long, 11 miles wide. It starts in, at Tel Aviv, modern day Tel Aviv, and it goes up to the foothills of Mount Carmel. That whole region saw him, saw this man, and turned uh, to the Lord. Do you know anyone who's paralyzed? Did you grow up with anyone in your neighborhood or your community that was paralyzed? Everyone knew uh, this person, for whatever the condition was, uh, they couldn't walk. I, I, my first experience of that is my mother worked at a nursing home, and she would come home and tell me about a man she cared for who was paralyzed, and, and she helped me understand his physical condition. Now, if, if you knew someone that was like that, what would be your response if you happened to look up in the doorway one day and the man that you've known has been paralyzed, bedridden, or hasn't been able to get out of a wheelchair for all the life that you can remember? 
He's suddenly standing there. She's suddenly standing there with this beautiful smile on her face. You can imagine the kind of impact this must have had upon the people and, and, and how dramatically uh, his life was changed. Jesus dramatically changes people's lives. Now, this didn't happen because, of an, because Aeneas had enough faith. He's, he's not the reason for the miracle. There's no evidence he had faith. This happened because this was God's purpose. Jesus healed this man for the purpose of the gospel being uh, going forth. Uh, Aeneas wasn't on Peter's agenda. Uh, Peter recognized the opportunity to demonstrate God's power to change a life. And so the way I'm going to try to get at this with the class is, is I'm going to ask him, did, did you have an opportunity this week to demonstrate God's power or to share the message of Jesus. And, I, and I'm, so I may have to give him an example from my own life to do that, but uh, the other day a man came to the church. Uh, he was dealing with something on our church property and I was with him. And when we finally had done our business before he left, I gave him a gospel track and his name was Jim. I said, Jim, when you have time, I know you're, you're on the dollar or your business right now. Would you read this little booklet? It changed my life forever. And he took the booklet and he told me he would read it. And I thanked him for it. So I'm just saying that was an opportunity that came my way. It wasn't on my agenda. Uh, it was something that he just showed up and, and we had the opportunity to present the gospel to him. Uh, um, did you miss an opportunity this week? Interestingly enough, I did. The reason why I was so aware of Jim is because the day before, um, a person had been at my home dealing with a water sprinkler, and I did not present the gospel to him. I didn't give him a gospel track. And so that was on my mind, and sure enough, here this guy comes, and so I missed the opportunity there. And my point I'm driving to drive at is, is God invites his followers to be instruments of his power, but we need to be aware of the opportunities that God gives us and to take advantage of. The second point is do not delay. Do not delay. Again, I want to go through the text and just give some explanation. Verse 36, in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha. That, that tells us a lot about her right there. She had accepted Christ's authority over her life. She sought to do the will of God. She's the only woman mentioned in Acts who is a disciple uh, of Jesus Christ. And you find the explanation for her name and the fact that it's translated in Greek. That tells you something of the importance of this person that, he, that Luke would take enough time to make certain we understood the person he's talking about. It says she was always doing good works and acts of charity. And the way it's written is it's saying that she did numerous good works and numerous acts of charity, and she continually did good works, and she continually did acts of charity. So this was a woman who was fulfilling God's command to do good, to be a light uh, in this world. Verse 37, about that time she became sick and died. And that's all the information we have. We don't know if the sickness was long or whether it was very brief. Uh, we just know that it leads to her death. After washing her, that's the normal practice in that culture, in that climate when someone had died. After washing her body, they placed her in a room upstairs. That's unusual. Now the bottom floor in the Jewish home was often used as a workplace or a storage place. Uh, sometimes it would be a place where they would shelter their animals, and they lived on the second floor. They would sleep on the second floor. And, and they have taken the second floor where, where whosoever home this is, and they have, they have placed her body there. That is an unusual thing. In that climate, the, the Jewish people would, would be in um, a hurry to bury the body. There would be mourning that would take place, but before the sun set in the evening, uh, their intention was to have the body buried. They didn't do that this time. Verse 38, since Lydda was near Joppa, about 10 miles difference, the disciples heard that Peter was there and sent two men to him who urged him. 
This is a strange comment. Don't you think the woman's dead? Listen to what they say. Dorcas is dead. And here's what they say. Don't delay in coming with us. Now, either they need to know, are you going to come with us? And if you're not, then we're hurrying back home so we can bury her body. But we need you to come now. <clears throat> um, you're at home. Visitors come to your home knocking on the door urgently. They report someone that you know has died. They ask you to come. And they make it, they convey it in such a way that you're not going there to minister to the people who are grieving. They want you to come for the person who's dead. Would you tell me, what would be your response? I'm not so certain. I mean, I would try to be kind and stuff, but I'm not real big hurry to put my shoes on. I mean, it's, nothing's going to uh, affect that no matter how quickly I get there. And yet Peter was one who, who went. Peter had to get over the idea that Tabitha can't be helped. Now, who or what is so powerful you wonder if they can be helped. It's something that, that you look at and you go, apart from the power of God, this is never going to change. I can, I can try to change it, but it's just not going to happen. But let me give you an example. The past 25 years in our country, we have seen a sea change in sexual morality and sexual mores and in understanding of sexual issues. It is unbelievable. We, there was a time when uh, homosexuality, you remember from the 90s, uh, don't ask, don't tell. Now it's just paraded. It's, it, and when it came to marriage, it was something that people didn't see as acceptable. Even politicians would say that. And now it's something that is celebrated and affirmed. And now we've gone on to transgenderism and and the celebration of all these other things in a sexual way. And it just seems like this issue is so powerful. It is overwhelming what has been traditional sexual understandings in America for 200 years. How in the world would we stop that? How would we possibly turn that back to a more traditional and Christian view? Maybe what I'm saying is controversial. So maybe you want to talk about our nation or Hollywood or the drugs that are out there or or maybe it's family members you look at a family member or a friend that that you go I just don't know if they'll how, the, how that could ever change in their lives that's what I'm driving at this is what Peter is facing he had to get over the idea that some that in a condition was beyond the power of God God is working all around us we need to see his working we need to join him in that. And oftentimes we're just too busy. We just need to take a moment. Where do you see God working in your life to, to bring life out of death? Is it a family member that it will take the power of God to bring that person out of death into life? Is it a family member, a, a friend? Is it a workplace? Is it something in your life or something in your home? This lesson says that God invites his followers to be instruments of his power. And Peter was beginning to understand that. And amazingly, he gets up and goes with these men to a woman that's dead. Now, the last point is arise. Uh, Peter got up and went with them. When he arrived... They led him to the room upstairs, and all the widows approached him. Now, these are people who are not strangers to death. They know what death is. They're weeping, and they're showing him the robes and clothes that Dorcas had made while she was with him. The robes is a reference where well, your, your uh, Bible study guide will tell you what those things are. And uh, they were showing him. 
when I left the first church I pastored, uh, the people had gone together and quilted, uh, made a quilt for me. And the patches were the names of the family members of that church. And they had sewed their names in there. And it was, it was a wonderful, wonderful gift. I, I, I saw the quilt just recently and thought about the wonderful memories of that quilt. My, my grandmother uh, quilted uh, a quilt for me uh, when I was born. She, she did that for every one of her grandchildren. And uh, it's a very special quilt to me, something I protect. And so something of that nature is happening. These, these women have on these clothes and, and they're telling Peter that Dorcas made this for me. So she was a seamstress. She was a disciple. She was someone who was always doing good. Uh, the, the list of things could just go on about this woman. So Peter, verse 40, Peter sent them all out of the room. And why he did that, I don't know. When, when Jesus did it, he kept those disciples with him and, and the parents, but but he sent them out. And then notice the difference between this experience and the other experience. He knelt down. He prayed. So there's a sense of greater dependence of, of, uh, on God because he's dealing with a dead body. And we don't know how long he prayed, but after he prayed, notice this, and turning toward the body. And I might say turning toward the dead body, he spoke. Tabitha, get up. Isn't it amazing, the power of God? Even death, even death doesn't, is not a struggle for Christ to overcome. Now notice these three responses. She opened her eyes. She saw Peter. <laughs> I don't think she'd ever seen Peter before in her life. Here's a man in her, in her room, and she's never seen this man. And she sat up. Now, verse 41 says, he gave her his hand and helped her to stand up. It's not because she's weak. That's not the idea that's there. It's, it's an act of chivalry. He's extending her hand just like you extend your hand to your wife when she's getting out of the car or she's stepping across a, a, a curb, onto a curb. So he, hand, he gives her his hand. He helps her stand up. And then he presents her. He called the saints. The, the community of believers and widows and presented her alive. Imagine how that must have exploded with joy and celebration and tears and prayers of thanksgiving. Verse 42, this became known throughout Joppa and many believe. That's the whole point of what's happening with these miracles. It's to affirm the gospel and the faith in Jesus. Peter stayed for some time in Joppa with Simon, a leather tanner. That's an interesting little tidbit that Luke puts in there. A leather tanner was considered unclean because he dealt with dead bodies and dealing with his business. In fact, if a Jewish man made a decision that he was going to be a leather tanner, the Jewish community said to his wife, if you want to divorce the man, you can do that. And that's how much, uh, how, that's the view they had of them. And so what you have here is a picture of Peter who's beginning to shift himself. He's a rather rigid person, and yet even in Peter, there's this shift that's going on. And it's going to take something even more powerful for him to be open to Gentiles, and we'll see that in our studies to come. My question for my class, have you been in a place where you said, I can't do this? I must have God. I'm asking the class for that kind of an experience. And, and again, you may need to give them an example that, that helps to spur that on. But I want to follow that up with, how did you first respond? When you came to this point, I can't do this. I, ha I have to have God. How did you respond? And what, what revealed to you that you were relying on God? Was it you went to your knees in prayer like Peter? Um, did you quite quit trying to fix somebody? Was that, was that the sign that you finally had gotten to where you were relying upon God? Did you stop worrying about it? Did you have a sense of peace? Did you stop trying to manipulate the circumstances? What was it that, that finally testified, I can't do this. I'm going to have to have God. When Jesus showed up, what was the difference that he made? Can you give us a 
testimony about that. Can you tell us about that? In 2000, I was in Africa on um, uh, an evangelistic crusade with a group of with a group and a number of people, and I had terrible uh, experience of uh, culture shock. And uh, I, I I'll go into more detail with that with the class if if the time permits and they need it. But the outcome of it was I I had a time with God where I said I, I can't go on. I, I've got to have some help, and I went and did my assignment. And in that assignment, as I was going across the countryside with the pastor, we came to two women and they eventually let me share my testimony and he translated and they both prayed to receive Christ. And when we're walking away, the, the, the man said, uh, the pastor said, that's good. Uh, that one woman was a witch doctor. And I began to think, well, maybe this is going to look up this day. And then the next experience that I had was, was one of the most powerful uh, experiences of the presence of Christ in my life. And it just lifted that depression off of me. It was an experience of the power of God. And that's what I'm asking about this issue of arise. Have you had an experience where you said, I can't do this. I have got to have you, God. And what, what was the outcome? How did you recognize that you had surrendered that to the Lord? The way I want to close the lesson is I want to tell them about my Sunday school teacher, Eldon Dameron. <clears throat> when I was a, an older grade school boy, I, occasionally when I went to Sunday school in church, I went to Eldon Dameron's Sunday school class. Eldon, I don't remember a lesson Eldon taught, but what I do remember is he really loved his Bible. I could, I, the things he said about it, the way he held it, Eldon Dameron was a man who loved to study and to read his Bible. And he had some ornery boys in that class, the other boys, not me, but he had some ornery boys in that class. Um, seven of those young men who went through Eldon Dameron's boys Sunday school class became preachers. I'm the only one that's a Baptist, the rest of them were Assembly of God, but he still loved me <laughs> and, and never called me a black sheep. But what I'm telling you is this, he was an instrument of God's power. Some people might see the teaching of a um, grade school boys class as a small thing, but I think it may have been a domino that God used Eldon to push to create that kind of a work in seven young men's lives to answer God's call to the ministry. And that's just the start of it. Who knows what all that he had done. Isn't it, isn't it wonderful to know that he invites us to be followers and instruments of his power? That's what you are, Sunday school teacher, and God bless you for your work.